Uh, so we want to get started with our program. Um, as I mentioned, we are delighted to welcome Gary Kelly back to the Wings Club for his ninth December with us. Uh, and each time he comes, both his and Southwest's list of accomplishments continue to grow. Gary is in his 30th year at Southwest. He serves as chairman of the board, president, and CEO. Southwest, as you probably know, is one of the most honored airlines in the world, known for their triple bottom line approach, which places equal value on people, the planet, and profit as they conduct their business. The success of this approach is clearly demonstrated in Southwest results. Southwest has grown to become the nation's largest airline in terms of originating domestic passengers, and their performance has been remarkable, delivering 43 years of consecutive profitability. I don't think any other airline or many other businesses could say that. In 2015, Southwest was named Airline of the Year by Air Transport World, and in 2016, were named by Forbes as one of America's top 20 best employers. And I, I think probably Terry and Gary will talk a little bit about that culture uh, during the interview session. Gary himself has also personally received numerous awards and recognitions over the years. Most recently, he was inducted into the Te Texas Business Hall of Fame. He is also the recipient of the prestigious 2016 Tony Janus Award. Gary, welcome back. Please join me up here on stage. And for today's interview session, we're very pleased to have Terry Maxson with us. Terry worked for 42 years as a daily reporter at the Dallas Morning News report before retiring last year. Uh, he spent 30 years at the Dallas Morning News, including more than 20 covering aviation and airlines. Terry has covered all aspects of aviation news, including mergers, bankrupt bankruptcies, although not at Southwest, strikes, lawsuits, <laughs> airport battles, and more recently, air airline profitability. Over the decades, he has seen it all. Interestingly, Terry began his career writing obituaries. Uh, we are hoping for something more uplifting today. Uh, hopefully, Gary will help us in that regard. Terry, please join us on stage. It's a pleasure to uh, uh, have you as my captive for, uh, for about a half hour uh, again. The, uh, Let's start with uh, what we call the slow uh, pitch of the cross middle plate. What's the state of the airline right now? How do you see Southwest now compared to, say, some of uh, the rougher stretches that, and the not too distant past uh, as you have various pressures? It, 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 you know, you have to force yourself sometimes to live in the moment, and the moment is just uh, supreme. It's uh, really good times for Southwest. And I think it's especially gratifying because our folks have been working uh, through a very tough patch, especially since 9-11, uh, to get to this point. And um, it's not just uh, the high tide floats all boats. Uh, you know, they've, they've done a lot to transform Southwest. It's been um, hard going at times, but um, our operation is outstanding. Uh, our people have been very well taken care of. I think they feel uh, very engaged at Southwest, very proud to be a part of Southwest. Customers love Southwest Airlines. Our net promoter scores are at record levels. And so the brand um, uh, is also very, very strong. And then the profits, you know, boosted by very low fuel prices in relative terms, uh, pro profits are at record levels. So uh, we had our November traffic released yesterday. We had a record load factor for the month of November. And um, that um, typically, except for Thanksgiving, was a relatively uh, you know, off-season time for, for the airline business. And now it's, it's close to 90% load factors you know, compared to the old days. So it's a remarkable time. And a lot of work is underway investing in the future. And I think we're all feeling really good about that. And uh, it's, a, it's a great day to be here with you. Because I know <laughs> that you'll find that little sore point somewhere. <laughs> well, okay, let's talk about labor then. Uh, five years ago this week, in fact, you uh, uh, 
had a hotline for your employees in which you warned them uh, of very grave consequences for Southwest on the issue of cost. You had had most of your major carrier uh, competitors uh, uh, had filed for bankruptcy, had restructured their cost of bankruptcy. At that time, American Airlines had been in bankruptcy for about a week, and you presumed what was going to happen in, in bankruptcy. Uh, reflect on those previous five years of the, uh, of the success or non-success of being able to control your cost, and, uh, and uh, as part of that, any damage it uh, may have done on uh, your relations uh, with employees who waited very long time to get contracts. Well, you know, the, the, the nature of the communication at that time, uh, and I'm going to have to change my number so you can't get access to that, uh, you know, like yeah. that. But, uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, but the nature of the communication was uh, to really level set with our employees that uh, there's nothing to be euphoric about a large competitor going bankrupt. It's not like uh, there's a victory here for us. And in fact, they're going to be able to, as Herb would always say, wash away all their sins uh, through the uh, washeteria of bankruptcy. And that's exactly what's happened. Uh, every single major airline that existed when you and I started working in this business is either gone or gone bankrupt, except for Southwest Airlines, uh, going back to the 1980s. So, uh, there are far more formidable competitors today, and their costs have come down while ours have continued to rise, and so our cost advantage is narrowed. This is exactly what I was uh, concerned about that's happened. Um, you know, we, we ask our, our people to uh, work very hard at Southwest, and there's a, a, this notion that we have called working the Southwest way. We ask them to work safely, we ask them to wow the customer, and we ask them to keep costs low. And we know that if we can offer great service at the lowest price, we'll win. And so that's just undeniable. Um, and there's a long history, of course, of uh, airlines failing that did not keep their costs under control. So I think we just need to continue to work with our people and um, work together to eliminate waste and inefficiency from the airline. And every company has these opportunities. Because at the same time, um, I can tell you from a historical perspective and also tell you that it's our desire that we don't want to get our low cost by paying our people poorly. And we never have. So our people are very, very well paid. We've never had a furlough, never had a pay cut, certainly never gone through bankruptcy. And um, they've been very well taken care of. And that's the thing I'm the most proud of, quite frankly. So it's a, it's a team effort. Um, it's a communications challenge, but uh, through thick and thin, we've uh, managed to stay together and, and uh, work like a family. So I'm very proud of our, very proud of our people and the way we work together. And follow up that you, your mechanics, you, know, you still have an open contract with them, but you did get pilots and flight attendants, and I believe ramp workers uh, before that. Right. The uh, uh, to, to to restate the question. Uh, do you, do you sense that there has been damage done to that relationship because of the length of the uh, bill and the pressures that you had to, the cost pressures you had to uh, hold them up against? Well, relationships are fragile. And relationships have to be nurtured. And they have their ups and downs. So it's not helpful to a relationship to have a lot of uh, negative rhetoric uh, and hurtful things said and things uh, drug out over a long period of time. Clearly that's not helpful. But I think the vast majority of people don't want to live that way. Uh, they want to believe in each other. They want to believe that the company cares about them and then we just have to go about the daily business of proving it to them. And it, um, it's just kind of like the presidential election. You see how the spirits of the country, just having that uncertainty resolved, whether you're for Trump or against him, uh, there's just a different attitude right now. And so getting the contracts done and behind us, um, and Mike Vandeman and I in particular, we interact with a lot of employees, a lot of uh, union contract employees, and we feel very warmly welcomed, and I think uh, vice versa. And Mike and I meet with um, employees every single week in large numbers of them. So it's nice to have those things done. 
Uh, but, uh, and Randy Babbitt, who may be, Randy, if you're, you're here today, hello, but uh, Randy, I'll attribute this to him, and he may have told it to you. You know, you don't want to confuse union negotiations with the way we relate to our employees, because they really are two different things. We have to work hard not to let them converge. But the union's job is to go out there and to uh, get the very best contract they can for the employees they represent. Uh, and they'll use a lot of uh, tactics to do that. The company's not going to behave that way. And no matter what, I love our people. No matter what. And, uh, and I think they know that. Uh, when you came to Southwest in 1986. Correct. And when I started covering Southwest in 1990, there's no question that Southwest was a low-cost carrier. Right. Can you still call Southwest a low-cost carrier today? Yes, although we're not as comparatively low cost as we were in 1990, uh, Terry, I, I would certainly concede that. And I do think that um, you know, Southwest is an unparalleled success, uh, not because of me. Uh, I'm just glad to have been a, a part of it uh, over the years. But unparalleled success, and it was inevitable that there would be airlines who would try to mimic that success. Um, not just in the United States, but around the world. And so that competition has come to life. Uh, competition is vigorous, and uh, it's got to incent us to get better. So what's a challenge for us as a 45-year-old company is to do this entire array of things very well. So we have very high ex expectations for us. Uh, and we're just going to have to now take it to the next level to find opportunities to drive our costs down, because we do have uh, airline competitors whose costs are lower than ours, primarily because they pay substantially lower wages than we do. So that is not something that we desire to do, uh, and it's also not practical to think that we'll go cut wages by 40%. Uh, that's not going to happen. But uh, we'll, we'll want to uh, take that challenge head on and continue to aspire to offer the best service at the lowest price. And if there's any airline out there that could realistically aspire to that, I think it's uh, the people of Southwest Airlines. You mentioned President-elect Trump. As best you can look into the future, uh, do you have, what, what effect do you think he might have on the airline industry? When I think about uh, Southwest and the industry, actually I'm excited uh, because uh, two of his major uh, themes, and without a lot of details, but with two of the major themes are tax reform, and infrastructure investment. And we would welcome both. Um, tax reform, corporate tax reform, reforming the cost burden, uh, the ticket, the, the, the tax burden, if you will, uh, for transportation, the regulatory burden. There's a long array of things that fit well with our Airlines for America agenda that we've been promoting for years. That is a plus. Um, and it does feel like for the first time in a long time, with a Republican White House, Senate, and House, we have a realistic opportunity to get something done. In addition to that, uh, to make a grand bargain, if you will, um, uh, along uh, uh, bipartisan lines, is the desire to invest in infrastructure. Um, without challenging all of us to conclude the wisdom of pursuing all of these things, air traffic control modernization is a no-brainer. It's beyond shovel ready. We're digging. It's just we're digging backwards. So we need, to, um, we need to align on how we get air traffic control modernized. And the uh, Trade Association, I think, has the best idea, which is to reform the FAA as to governance uh, and as to uh, uh, funding. So um, I, mean, I, I think that there's a realistic opportunity for both of those that um, 30 days ago I didn't think was there. Uh, in particular, do you think uh, the privatization of the uh, ATC system will go forward? I think that there is actually renewed enthusiasm among the champions for the idea, which includes the industry, that there's, there is a greater opportunity to get something done uh, now. So we, yeah, we'll, we're going to have a big push. Privatize isn't the, the, the best word. We want to create a not-for-profit corporation that is governed differently. Take it out of the hands of Congress so that you don't suffer all the funding starts and stops, sequestration, furloughs, and all of those other issues, and put the, the men and women who are air traffic controllers uh, in a position 
where they have modern tools and, and real support uh, from a funding perspective and leadership perspective to get something done. They do a very fine job. It is amazing how well they perform their jobs with the uh, antiquated 1950s technologies that they have. They're understaffed. It takes a long time in, in a, an environment like uh, New York City and the complexity of air traffic uh, space here. It takes a long time for an air traffic controller to be qualified uh, to, uh, to work uh, in this uh, uh, environment. And um, we need to change that. We need to make this a better opportunity for people to work. So it's not a matter of trying to reduce air traffic controllers. It actually is quite the opposite. I think we have a, uh, a great opportunity to improve the efficiency of the system and the capacity of the system. Uh, in the regulation of airlines and airports, uh, what are the top three things on your list that, that you want to see change? whether it's a regulation or a, a limitation or, or however you'd like to define that. Do you, do you have a list, your wish list? Well, first of all, you know, we've been talking about air, 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 ATC modernization, which again, the means to that, uh, as we see it, is uh, FAA reform. So that's, that's clearly number one. Number two, there, there's been an alarming uh, move um, in recent years to re-regulate the airlines. And, um, uh, and I'm surprised at that. The performance of the industry has improved dramatically. On-time performance, baggage handling, the number of complaints, etc. There's a lot of noise about the airlines that uh, choose to charge uh, bag fees, which is everybody but Southwest Airlines, by the way. <laughs> and uh, we enjoy that, but it ought to be the uh, decision of a company as to how they decide to package their, their goods and, and uh, services. So um, uh, we, we don't, we're concerned about the nanny state. So right now there's been an effort or a threat uh, that you would be very familiar with to force airlines to list their product uh, on um, uh, an online website other than uh, ours. And um, so I think that there's an opportunity to avoid that kind of thing. The tarmac delay rule is another one, I think, uh, that could be vastly improved upon as to how it is implemented. No one wants for customers to be trapped on airplanes on tarmacs for an extended period of time. Uh, but uh, there's, a, I think, a much better way to uh, approach that. So there's a variety of things that we would love to work with the new administration on. And uh, uh, we're uh, supportive of... Uh, Mr. Trump's choice for DOT secretary, and I think there's opportunities to make some improvements there. Okay. Um, you have entered a number of markets uh, in recent years, mostly international markets. Uh, first, I'd like to ask, what's your early reading on Cuba? I realize it's only been, what, three and a half weeks since you launched from Fort Lauderdale, but do you have a sense that there's going to be the traffic uh, 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 to support all the flights by all the airlines going into Cuba, particularly until the, uh, 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 all the travel limitations are taken off? Yeah, I think so. You know, we, we've tried to um, be uh, honest in our assessment of the near-term um, results. Um, all of this, uh, you know, the opportunity to, to fly to Cuba was not in our 2016 plan at this time last year. Um, uh, th this all became um, a reality in February, and uh, many of our uh, commercial leaders are here who responded very quickly to a short deadline to be able to put in an application uh, for slots to serve Cuba. My point of that being that um, since it is within a year where we already had capacity constraints with our plan, this is a fairly modest change for us. So these are short flights from Florida. It makes sense for us in our route system. We were able to crowbar that in. Uh, so the overall risk to uh, Southwest, if these flights don't perform well, is very, very, it's de minimis, uh, quite frankly. However, uh, we're excited about the opportunity to get started. We're talking about half a dozen daily round trips. And um, there's no history. There's no way to forecast on whether that's the right number of flights or not. Um, but we've made a living out of doing this going into markets uh, with a belief that if we serve the markets well, 
at low prices, we'll be able to stimulate uh, enough traffic to fill up our airplanes. So uh, with what we're seeing so far, I don't see any reason to believe that that won't be the case here in Cuba. Uh, but yeah, in fairness, it's been three weeks with no, with no way to gauge what we should expect. So my expectations right now are very low, but I would tell our people and the Cuban people that we're making a commitment to serve this, and we're gonna give it the old college try and uh, do our best to make it work, which means that we're not gonna be coming back in March cutting flights. We're just not gonna do that. Uh, Andrew Watterson may have, uh, our, our senior VP over network planning, may do seasonal adjustments, but in terms of making a commitment to the market, uh, that's what we do, and uh, I'm excited about it. So we'll, uh, we'll see. And the holidays look really good, you know, with those markets. So I think uh, we'll have uh, plenty of people who want to fly. It would help if we could lift some of the restrictions on travel. I'm sure you all know, but you can't travel for tourism and I have asked Andrew, then why are we going to two beach resorts if people can't travel for tourism? <laughs> and he just laughs like you all do. Because so. yeah. that's what was available, right? Yeah. The, well, uh, uh, speaking of which, I, uh, no discussion between you and me is complete without me asking you about Hawaii. And since I'm asking about Hawaii, I'll ask you, ask you about Canada. You've always said they're uh, uh, on your horizon, but you uh, never said how far away. So, how far away are Hawaii and Canada uh, for the Southwest uh, route system? It's, they're not in our 2017 plans, and uh, we're on a, it's a journey. We've done a lot uh, in a short period of time. If you uh, sort of take a six-year time horizon, uh, 2014 in particular, you know, we had the Right Amendment repeal uh, go into effect, and we had to put a lot of capacity in to grow our flight activity there. We integrated AirTran uh, that year. Um, we're growing our capacity. It's kind of a follow-on to a big year last year, about five to six percent. We acquired slots uh, here and at Washington Reagan uh, with the American merger. Uh, so we've been real busy. Built a terminal uh, for international service in uh, Houston after international service was launched in 2014. So you know, I'll take a breath here. But the point is, we've had we've we, we've had priorities, and Hawaii and Canada were outside of those priorities. Um, now we are launching a reservation system, opening up a, a terminal uh, for international in Fort Lauderdale next year. We've got the MAX coming online in uh, fourth quarter next, or third quarter next year, and uh, the, uh, retire the retirement of the classics also in the third quarter. So we'll be really busy in 2017. I think both uh, Hawaii and uh, Canada will, will need to be thoughts 2018 and thereafter. But it's something that is high on our list. Um, there are um, technology needs for each of those entities for Southwest, uh, and some of the planning for us will be a, a matter of how we factor in that technology work. Um, but in, in thinking about, you know, for a company, um, co companies should desire to grow. They grow earnings, but also grow earnings by growing revenues and grow revenues uh, by not just having uh, price increases. You know, so we'd like to grow our volumes, grow our customers. And the luxury for us, never had this in our history, as you've covered us, is we have such a vast array of opportunities to expand, it far exceeds the airplanes that we have. So uh, Hawaii and uh, Canada will just need to fight their way onto our, our priority list. The, uh, speaking of airplanes, you're a 737 exclusively, right. and when you needed a bigger airplane, you got a bigger 737. Right. Um, have, you, have you started planning for uh, the day when Southwest will need something other than a 737? No. <laughs> Sorry, Barry. Uh, uh, but in fairness, we're busy on other stuff, you know, so we have a long list of things that we want to do, and the airline is just not well prepared to operate equipment other than the 700 and the 800 soon to be, and, and the classics, and soon to be, uh, you know, the Max-8, and then following that, the Max-7. So um, I, I think strategically, we're very well positioned with the array of opportunities that we have in North America and South America. The 737 is a fantastic airplane for us. So that day, so we'll end this year with 723 airplanes in the fleet. I think the uh, growth opportunities for us may be as many as 500 more 737s. Mm -hmm. 
Sorry, Barry. Yeah. Yeah. But the, you know, at some point, is there going to come a day where either f by acquisition or by um, uh, market need, we, we need another airplane? Yeah, I think so, but it's, uh, it's not anytime soon. And no, Mike's not spending any time at all working on that. The, um, well, a question came up as we were uh, uh, during the reception that I hadn't occurred. Why can't you get above a triple B plus? Why, why won't the rating agencies? Uh, you've got a great balance sheet. It's probably a better <laughs> balance sheet back when you had an A rating. What's, uh, why, why have you hit a ceiling? Well, you know, before the financial crisis, uh, we were an A. And uh, the balance sheet is the strongest today uh, that it's been in history, in our history, you know. So it is, I think it is a question that we have also. Is it an irritation? Uh, well, um, irritation, no. I have other things I could get irritated at, you know, but uh, <laughs> uh, no, we, we just, we'll, we keep making our case. I think uh, the world changed, to, to be blunt, after the financial crisis. And I think it exposed some problems. I think the uh, credit rating agencies are very fine uh, institutions, and they've kind of remade themselves also. Um, and that's where we got re-rated, you know. And uh, so we're, um, I, guess, I guess, you know, Tammy, if I were to, uh, to, if we were to complain, I don't know that we feel like that the U.S. companies are on the same footing as what we perceive some of our international counterparts to be. If you just looked at all the various credit statistics. We seem to be penalized a bit more here. Uh, so yeah, I think we have a few th things that we want to continue to prosecute, if you will, to make our case. But um, I think that it is more likely that we should be upgraded as opposed to downgraded. And uh, we'll just uh, keep arguing, arguing for that upgrade. Uh, let's see, United imposed the first bag fee in 2008, if right. I remember correct. I believe that's and, right. And uh, it seemed like almost every earnings call after that uh, uh, analyst encouraged Southwest to impose a back That's pay. a polite word, yes. Yeah, so, so, so here's an impolite question. When they're making that recommendation, are they trying to help Southwest or are they also trying to help the other airlines in their por por portfolio? Uh, it's but a fair question. Uh, I, and I don't know. I don't know. I think that's one of the things that we just have to be mindful of as the managers of Southwest. We're the ones with the fiduciary duty to our company and our shareholders to do what's best for Southwest. And uh, we have investors that own Southwest, they own Brand X, they own JetBlue, et cetera. And uh, we, you, you never know. You never know what the motive is in urging us to do various things. So we take it straight up that they're trying to help Southwest and make Southwest better in terms of an investment. Uh, but in the end, you know, it's up to us to make that judgment. And, and again, the investors don't come to us with a single voice. The voices are all over the map, and there are thousands of investors. So um, it's up to us to figure out what the right uh, thing to do is. And um, I think a lot of people understand that differentiation can be really powerful, and especially if it's in a way that leads to very high customer satisfaction. I just happened to meet the CEO of Glassdoor.com yesterday. And uh, he was describing what he's out touting as the Southwest effect. Now, most of us in the room know the 1993 DOT definition of the Southwest effect. He's using the Southwest effect of very high employee engagement to the success of the company. And what's my point here? It's hard for employees to really be proud of their company and be engaged if they're not proud of their product. And I think our people are very proud of the fact that uh, we bend over backwards to take care of our customers and we don't nickel and dime them. And I think it translates into a very powerful business model. And it is especially powerful because we are the only ones who do that. Uh, our, our time is about run out. So let me ask this question. I, I, I've wondered, and this isn't a push, you understand, but you'll turn 62 in March, if I'm correct. Really? Uh, Gordon, Gordon Bethune uh, retired when he was 63, Richard Anderson at 61. Wimps. Uh, Bob Crandall at 62. Uh, Slackers. Uh, 
are, are you going are you going to be the next nope. you going to be the next Bob Crandall <laughs> or the next uh, Herb Kelleher? I you know I don't know that I have a uh, I don't I don't have a plan. Sometimes I think it's a little dangerous to make plans like that. I guess that's basically the question. Do you, you have, do you have a plan uh, where you say at that point in the future I'm out of here? I think it's artwork. I think you uh, you one needs to do what is best for the the family, the team, the the organization. I love what I'm doing. And uh, as long as the board says I'm doing a good job and they want me to do the job, uh, I want to continue to do that. Uh, at the same time, um, uh, you know, the calendar moves on. And uh, I don't want to be sitting here when I'm 70 years old and have not prepared our company for the best, smoothest, most successful uh, leadership transition in the history of mankind. That needs to be my assignment. Uh, and I'm very passionate about that. And I will admit to you, I'm a lot more focused on that question today than I was when I, uh, when I was 49 years old, you know? So uh, there's also, I think, uh, every company needs energy and enthusiasm and um, fresh thinking. And I, I have to continue to challenge myself to make sure that that's what I'm bringing to our team. Uh, and I, of course, rely very heavily on my teammates uh, to do that, and uh, the, they're all here today, and they're they're all phenomenal. Best team we've ever had at Southwest Airlines. So, um, one does not want to stay too long, mm -hmm. and it'll be 13 years next year. So I don't think that is too long, no. but uh, you know, for CEO vintage, it's uh, getting a little bit long in the tooth. But uh, I have no plans to um, do it. I certainly have no plans to work anywhere other than Southwest Airlines. Uh, and uh, no, no plans to uh, retire at all. Yeah. With that, we should let you go, but thank, thank you very you, much for being here.